Welcome to this Goyle Crime Cymru Festival event, and welcome to Aberystwyth. Croeso i'r digwyddiad Goyle Crime Cymru Festival hwn a chroeso i Aberystwyth. Aberystwyth, the cultural capital of Wales, home to Aberystwyth University and the National Library of Wales, once home to Welsh princes. The Beeritz of Wales is the jewel in the crown of Cardigan Bay's stunning coastline and home to hugely successful TV drama Hinterland. And now, the streets that have become familiar to fictional D.I. Matthias' many fans are getting ready to welcome celebrities from the worlds of crime fiction and crime drama. Because Aberystwyth is home to Wales' first ever international crime fiction event, Goyle Crime Cymru Festival. During the early May Bank holiday weekend of 2022, ABBA, as the town is affectionately known, will play host to a multitude of events that will offer something for every fan of crime fiction and drama. Internationally successful authors will entertain and meet readers in historic buildings. Pub quizzes will bring together authors and readers. Writing workshops, meet the agent sessions and informal readings will help encourage and develop new writing talent. And in sparkling celebration of new Welsh talent, a champagne reception for Crime Cymru's first crime novel competition winners. This will be an Aberbank holiday weekend like no other. So, come for the crime fiction and take Cymru home in your hearts. Rydym yn edrych ymlaen yn fawr iawn at eich croesawu i Aberystwyth. Ac i geredigion. Brynhawn da, Croeso. Good afternoon and welcome to The Plot's The Thing the 11th event of Wheel Crime Cymru Festival, Wales' first international crime literature festival, which is being run in partnership with Aberystwyth Town Council. My name is Mark Ellis. I'm a Swansea boy and a proud member of Crime Cymru, and I'm also the author of the Frank Miri Merlin series set in World War II London. I'm delighted to have been asked to moderate this great panel. In the panel, we should be discussing plots, where they come from, how they're put together. No doubt we'll touch on other literary matters of interest as well. If you have any questions, please use the chat function of YouTube to submit them. And if you have any, uh, and the wonderful Amy Williams will be joining us later to pass on as many as she can to us. The panel will last for approximately 45 minutes and then there'll be 15 minutes questions. Before I introduce the three wonderful author authors joining me today, I'd like to mention that the festival has partnered with a number of independent Welsh bookshops for these events. Each panel has one specifically affiliated shop, stocking the books of panel members, and if you're interested in buying books from these or other authors. I encourage you to get them from our affiliated shop, which is Penarath Bookshop in Machantleth. Details on our website. Now, having demonstrated my Welsh pronunciation creds, let me introduce you to my guests, <coughs> an international group embracing India, England, Ireland, and Wales. We're very lucky to have these writers at our festival. First up is Vazim Khan. Vazim was born in England, but has experience of working in India for several years. He's the best-selling and award-winning author of two crime series set in India, the Baby Ganesh Agency series set in modern Mumbai, and the Malabar House historical crime novels set in 1950, and featuring India's first woman police detective, Persis Wadia. Vazim's works have been translated into 15 languages, a new Persis Wadia novel, The Dying Day, will be published this summer. Welcome, Vasim. Hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. Hi, great to have you with us. Oh, great Second to be up, here. I'm, I've just got a frog in my throat, so excuse me. You'll, you'll notice it's the right sort of cup. <laughs> Second up is R.G. Adams. 
R.G. Adams is the pseudonym of a former social worker. Hi, Robin. Hi. With 30 years of experience across all areas of social services. She lives with her family in South Wales. Her debut novel, Allegation, about the investigation of a case of historical sexual abuse, was published earlier this year by River Run, and a second is in the pipeline. Allegation has been optioned for TV by Red and Black Films. Welcome again, Robin. Hello, hi. <clears throat> Third, and finally, Sam Blake. Sam has written a number of best-selling crime novels. Hi, Sam. Hello. Including a series featuring Irish detective Kathy Connolly. Her novel, Keep Your Eyes on Me, went to the top of the crime charts in 2020, and her latest novel, The Dark Room, has also been flying high. She also, in another guise, runs the literary website writing.ie. Originally from Hertfordshire, she now lives with her family in County Wicklow, Ireland. Welcome, Sam. Hi, thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. It's a pleasure. Okie doke. Uh, before we get down to the nitty gritty of plot creation, could I ask you each to say a little bit about your work and your latest novels, the so-called elevator pitch? Um, Sam, why don't you go first? Oh, you're rotter. Um, so <laughs> The Dark Room is set in West Cork. Um, it is set in a, a country house hotel called Hare's Landing. Um, and essentially it's a story about two women who meet in Hare's Landing to investigate a mystery. Um, in fact, one of them, Caroline Kelly, has come from over from New York. She's um, struggling in work and she just needs a break. So she's come for a holiday, but she gets sucked into um, the mysteries that the house has of its own. Um, so as well as um, the, the basic investigation, uh, a girl called Rachel is, is investigating the death of a homeless man and she ends up in West Cork in Hare's Landing. Um, the, the actual house itself has a whole load of things going on. Uh, so it's a bit spooky, uh, but it's uh, it's a good it's a good takes you away from here. I think we can't travel at the moment, and so anybody who needs to go to West Cork, um, it's a it's a good opportunity for them to have a little dip in, see what Ireland's like. Thank you. I read it. I thought it was oh. a sweeping, engaging Irish story, reminding me a bit of Daphne du Maurier, and oh, a little bit well, of that's... a bit of gothic in there. I thought it was great. Thank you so much. And um, I have to say, it's only ninety nine p on Kindle at the moment too. So okay, a bargain. Early. Bargain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Robin, how about you? Uh, thank you, yes. So my debut novel, Allegation, is set in a small seaside town called Sand Beach. It's a fictional town in South Wales, but very typical, I think, of our seaside towns here. And it concerns Kit Goddard, who's a young, newly qualified social worker, but also a care leader herself. She's very robust, she's resilient, and she's extremely clever and she is allocated a case that is probably too much even for her, um, and probably more than she can cope with at her level of experience, or at least so it seems at the beginning. And it concerns a powerful local family um, who are heavily involved in local politics, and the father of the family has been accused of historical sexual crimes, and it is Kit's job to find out whether he presents a risk to his own children. And in order to do that, she has to either get past or work with his redoubtable wife, Annie. Um, Kit also has a, a complication in her private life with her twin brother, Tyler, who is more of a casualty, really, of the care system than Kit is. So in summary, that's allegation. Great. Thank you. I read that, too. I thought it was thrilling um, and a very gripping read. And I zipped through it. Thank you. OK, uh, Vasi. Yeah, hi, Mark. Uh, so I, I write two stories, uh, two series, as you as you pointed out. Uh, the first uh, is a series of five books called the Baby Ganesh Agency novels, and they feature a policeman from the Mumbai police force who is forced into retirement in his mid forties. Uh, his name is Chopra, very rigid, honest man. And on his last day in office, he inherits a, a baby elephant, which uh, you know it's a metaphor, it's a symbol for India, and. Uh, we, I'm sure we'll talk about how that ended up in the, in the plot of a crime novel in, in due course. Uh, what I also write are a series of historical crime novels set in 1950s Mumbai, which was then called Bombay at that, at that point. And uh, they're exploring a very volatile period in, in Indian history, just a couple of years after independence, Gandhi's assassination and the, the horrors of partition. And the first of those came out last year. It's called Midnight at Malabar House. And as you also uh, mentioned, it features India's first female police uh, inspector, uh, Persis, who is investigating the murder of a very prominent English diplomat in Bombay. Uh, so I think uh, we'll talk about the 
other part aspects of the plot later, I think. Yeah, okay, um, I read that one too. Um, I've been very busy and I thought it was fascinating and entertaining period crime thriller. I didn't know much about partition and um, I thought that was very, very interesting. I hadn't really appreciated the, the scale. I knew there was a lot of violence, but I hadn't really appreciated the scale of things that went on. So that was great. Okay, let's move on. Plotting. Now, um, I've got some words that I really only picked up this week from other panels, but there appears to be a rough division of writers into those who are pantsers, i.e. seat of the pantsers, who do, do just that, and those, and they don't plan their books in great detail. Then uh, the more prosaic word or description plotters covers those who do. Of course, there will be authors who range in the spectrum. I'm an out and out pantser. Which are you? Uh, Robin. I, I'm the same, I'm afraid, and I really wish I wasn't. I, it would be a lot less stressful to be able to plan it out, but I just can't do it. Um, I wrote Allegation, actually, as part of a, an MPhil in writing at the University of South Wales, and I can remember one of my tutors saying to me, what you really need to do is you need to sit down and you need to put together a character wheel and you need to work out what colour tie would he wear and would he drink gin and tonic. And I tried to do that, and it killed the process for me, stone dead. I just didn't enjoy it. So the only way I can write, actually, is to dive in, to get myself into a lot of trouble with the plot, and then try and fight my way back out of it. It just seems to be the way it is. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm the same. I'm, and the, the, the advantage, main advantage, is you don't know who's done it until you got to the end. No, that's right. But it's actually being yeah. like a reader, you know. Of course, yeah. there's another 20 edits that come up. It's great that. to have the surprise, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Uh, well, I'm the exact opposite to, to, to Robin. Um, you know, I, I wrote seven novels over 20 odd years that were not published uh, and I've written seven since. So after all of that time, I think the one thing that I have learned is that having a really detailed plan uh, makes the process of writing a crime novel so much, uh, not just easier, but less stressful. Uh, and, you know, there are various things that I'm sure we'll discuss about how you go about doing that. But for me, I mean, I'm quite detailed. Start with a, with a murder usually and work your way back, seed in some red herrings. I think the other thing that I really think is useful when you take the time, so I take about three or four months to uh, really get a detailed plan together and then I can write very quickly so I can write a thousand words a day because the plan is already in place. But I think if it allows you when you take that much of time um, to think about the themes of your work uh, and themes are something that the, the industry loves. I mean, publishers absolutely love a good theme because they can hang a lot of marketing off the back of it. So, for instance, in, in my novels, uh, one of the themes is trying to present India to a Western audience in a way that uh, possibly they haven't seen before. We, we're a little bit guilty in the West of mythologizing India and turning it into a land yeah. of just swamis and snake charmers and people dancing in the streets. But it would shock people to know that Indians don't routinely get up and dance every five minutes uh, in the streets. Um, and so for me, it's about having the time to be able to create that extra layer to the fiction, to the crime plot, as, not just as a backdrop, but it weaves its way way into those uh, into those books. Uh, it was quite interesting in, in, in your book that I read. Um, people don't think so much about the people, the British people who stay on. I mean, I know there's a whole series of books by Paul Scott called Staying On. But, you know, about the, the, the businessmen and the policemen and so on who, who hang around and what life was like for them, too. And I, I found that very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's quite an odd dynamic just after partition. A lot of people don't realise that there were tens of thousands of foreigners, uh, especially Brits, who stayed in India after 1947. Uh, when the country was made independent and also chopped up into Pakistan, India, and what later became Bangladesh. And a lot of those people had never even been to England or they'd been spent most of their life in India. So for them, the, the idea of having to go to this cold, wet country uh, where, you know, they didn't have servants, they didn't have drivers, it was just uh, unthinkable. And so they wanted to stay in, but yeah. they were living in an environment where they were no longer they were no longer in command. They were no longer in charge. They couldn't call the shots anymore. So it was quite uh, a wrench for them to go away from the lifestyles that they had previously lived to this new environment that they found themselves swimming around in. Yeah, Mumbai to Dundee is quite a change, really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. How about you, Sam? Are you a pantser or a plotter? I'm like Basim. I'm a plotter. And I like to spend time working, yeah, working through those ideas, really developing character. I think character 
A plot is obviously very important in crime, but for me, character is really important. And you can hear Vasim there talking about his characters and how obviously they are just, they dominate the story as well. Um, so for me, character is very important, how they interact, their backgrounds. Um, so I like to get to know them really, really well. Um, and then research location and then be thinking about the plot the whole time. Um, and yeah, like like Vasim, thinking about themes and things like that um, that are going to go into the story. And then, yeah, I have quite a rigid plot um, system that I've developed I've mainly I find the more I listen to people um, whenever I listen to other authors talk I learn something new and I'm literally always you know it's amazing how we we all sit here talking and we're all doing things in completely different ways but yet we all come up with the same end product um, and I think it's wonderful that everybody's creativity is different and I mine ideas left right and center from different people so I've sort of developed a, a plotting process which is um, literally sort of tables in word and I will map out my chapters roughly they won't all be there and sometimes things can swing away dramatically um, and change so I'm not rigidly stuck to that framework but it gives me very much a sense of where the book's going and I like to know what the last scene's going to be I like to have that in my head so I know where I'm going um, so yeah no I would be quite quite a plotter but then again I can write a quick too yeah so I would write first draft in like you know three or four months um, because I've got it all laid out because I've done that work already um, and I know where I'm going with it. So, yeah, but I know about the, yeah, um, Robin killing the creativity. I know a lot of people who are like that, who need that, that edge of the cliff sort of experience <laughs> to get through the end for you, Mark, too. Um, need that to keep you pushing through. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just, yeah, I do plot it, but then I can change the killer at the end. I've done that twice where I've completely changed the way the direction of the book's going. So. So, but do you have all of the characters lined up, the, the, the good guys, the bad guys, the murderer, the, the murdery, if that's the right word? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. And But as I say, I do, I do change them. So sometimes I'll get halfway through and I find, you know, if I don't know who the, like you quite rightly say, if you don't know who the killer is at the start of the book, then ha the reader's never going to guess. And so I, with two of my books, I've gone all the way through and Dark Room was actually one of them where I thought I knew where I was going. I thought I knew what was going to happen. And actually I changed it quite a lot at the end. Um, so I hadn't plotted out the, the final bit of the dark room. I knew that there's a big thing that happens at the end. We won't have any spoilers. And that's sort of um, that a lot of things hinge on. And um, I hadn't I knew that happened, but I didn't know um, how it happened or why it happened and what the results were. So that I found out then as I was writing. Um, and I love that, too. I love the surprise that writing gives you, you know, that, yeah. that bit when the when the characters take over and it all all starts to happen. Okay, great. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so, Robin, if you're like me, um, I, does that mean you do an awful lot of edits? Because uh, <laughs> I do. I do about. I think the last book I did about twenty-two edits. Yes, yes. There is there is a lot of work to be done afterwards, isn't there, to get it to get it right? Um, yeah. And that's why I say I really wish I could be different, but I just just seems to be the way it is. Really, um, characters just appear to me when I sit down to write in a way that they don't when I try and plan it. You know, they appear in the in the here and now when I've got to get it on the paper. If I try and think about it outside of that time, I hear people saying that they think about their writing when they're walking or when they're running. I try to think about my writing when I'm running, but I really can't. It's got to be <laughs> when I come to put it on the page. Great. So so um, this is probably a more of a question for, for Seam and Sam. When you've created all your characters um, in advance, does that assist you in creating the plot? because you've got Joe Bloggs who's got certain characteristics and um, does that does that say, well, he's obviously a bad guy or he's a good guy or whatever, the scene? Yeah, in, to a great extent, I think, I mean, we have to ask, why do we read crime fiction? I mean, obviously we read crime fiction because uh, of the mystery element, but also if you look at the, the series that people follow, the series that they're loyal to, a large part of it is to do with character. And as Sam said, you, you, if you spend enough time with your character and you create a character that readers want to spend more time with, they will forgive you the odd plot inconsistency. They will give you the odd not so stellar book in a series. Not every single book in re really long run running series is up to the same, same mark. But because people have fallen in love with your characters, uh, they are willing to go for that ride with you. Now, uh, Midnight at Bal Malabar House, trying to create that novel, it really was a creation of I knew I wanted to write in that period because I wanted to explore the history of Bombay. And I also wanted to do it side by side with the history of the British in Bombay, uh, particularly just after that period when they'd left, because that's not a very well explored period in history. And then I started with a, with a male character 
And then after a while, I thought, well, that's not that interesting. I've written a male character. What would be super interesting is to take a, a woman, a female police officer, because there were none in 1950 in India. The first one was probably uh, half a decade later. Uh, but to put her in that environment in a country which, uh, regrettably, was and continues to be very patriarchal, uh, quite misogynistic, especially in that era when women were generally consigned to the house. And then to put her in this environment where the police forces anyway got a terrible reputation in India for being generally corrupt and, and bumbling and abusive. And she's and to get Persis to be in that environment and then put one of the biggest cases in the country into her lap, and a case that nobody else wants. And that because she is determined to make this work, because she's the kind of person that if you tell her no, she, she just, that, that just makes her even more determined. It means that the plot started to unfold uh, be, uh, as by virtue of the fact that she was this lone woman trying to run this case. So yeah, to a great extent, your characters will determine aspects of your plot. And did, did you manage to find out anything in detail about the actual, the, the real first female detective or was it just oh, yeah well, yeah easy? yeah there's some great stories of the first female pioneers in india and uh, the first police woman she did go on to become a, a senior officer but that was almost by 1970 the best story was uh, a woman who married into a family of aviators um and because they had eight aviators in the family and she she took an interest uh, they decided to give her I think it was something like 10 hours worth of flying lessons. And then they put her in this, in this gypsy moth plane and said, go on, off you go, fly this plane. And luckily she didn't crash it. Uh, she became India's first licensed female uh, pilot. And it's, it's, it's got this amazing picture of her in a sari uh, flying this thing with one of those big old star <laughs> aviator, wow. aviator caps. And, uh, Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So Sam, in, in the, the dark room, um, when you were putting together the plot, which came first, the house or the two strong female characters or the dog well actually it was a very strange experience i was finishing another book um which i thought was going to be the book after keep your eyes on me so i've written the three police procedurals which are a series and then the two standalones um and i was finishing up this i was in cornwall on holiday and i was finishing up my right whenever i am wherever i am and i was finishing it up and i was sitting on the sort of rocky outcrop just above the beach um in uh, Helford passage in cornwall where i go on holiday and i had just had this image came into my head of this woman jogging along the beach with a german shepherd dog running along behind her and um it was so strong i just thought there has to be a story here there's this is so strange i was i suppose it's like daydreaming isn't it, it happens to us all but it was just very strong and i could really see i can still see her uh, jogging away from me and um i started thinking about her and i was where i was sitting dead opposite me just across the river is a cottage and in the cottage garden or in the edge of the cottage there's like a, a ruined tower um, and I discovered that the ruined tower is actually the customs officer's jail. In this, it was built in the 1700s, and we're on a, an estuary there, so that any bit shipping that was coming up the estuary had to stop and be checked and such like. I'd say a few people ended up in the jail too. Um, so I had the image of this woman where I was sitting with the jail opposite me, and then I went up to see a friend of mine who um, has a pottery in the nearby village. And um, we, I actually went up because she has um, she she's a potter and she has this kiln. And she, we, were, we were having a conversation about how it, handy it would be that if you needed to get rid of a body, that a potter's kiln is quite a useful thing. And I just wanted to see how big it was. It's the type of thing you do when you're on holiday. Um, and she um, made these beautiful tiles. So I went into her workshop and there's this beautiful tile of a hair. Um, and I'd seen some hairs in London. Um, a friend of mine's a printer and had been printing hairs across a map. And um, I have these sort of things called light. I feel like they're like light bulb moments in my head uh, when I see something and it and it just it gels and it becomes. I know it's going to be part of a story. I don't know how it's going to factor into a story or what story it's going to go into. But, you know, the tower, the girl, the hairs, these sort of light bulbs are going off in my mind. And as I came back from visiting the pottery, I started thinking about this girl and who she was and where she could be. And I came up with the idea of Hare's Landing as a country house hotel because I actually drove past um two big country houses um, and Treba Gardens at one and um, there's another one on the way back down to, to where we were staying and um, I had this idea of this country house hotel and then I had to find out who the girl was and who the dog was um, and in fact the girl became Caroline Kelly who is the American in the story uh, they're both Irish they're both Irish but they've been away and they've come back and the dog isn't even her dog the dog's Rachel's dog and uh, he has a very significant part in the story because he's an ex-police dog 
and um, his skills are really, really important. Um, but I think you draw on things down in the in the estuary. The, one of the guys who looks after the boats um, and does the moorings, he's one of the moorings officers, is an ex-police officer and he has he's a dog handler. And we'd had lots of chats um, while I, when we've been down there um, outside the ferry boat in. And um, so these things all come together and they start to form story. And then, I don't know, it just sort of merges and you take it somewhere else. And that's really how it grew. Yes, yeah, so I started literally start with the characters and then it's like, well, what's their story? It's nearly like... Um, Joseph O'Connor talks about um, characters sort of floating around in ether above writers' heads, looking for somebody to land on. Um, and when the, they find the right writer, the story then comes. And I think it's that. It's, you start off with these images of these people, and then it's like, well, what is their story? That's what I need to find out. Okay. Um, I hope so, there's yeah. some characters waiting for me up there somewhere. You know? Exactly. <laughs> See, from Frank Merlin, you, you're walking through the streets of, uh, streets of London, blitzed out. And there he is, waiting for his <laughs> stories. So, yeah. so Robin, um, it, it's a slightly different setup for you, isn't it? Because you're writing about a uh, social worker, is your heroine as a social worker and uh, dealing with terrible cases. And that's your background as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how easy or otherwise difficult to disentangle your real experiences from your literary fictional experience? Um, uh, oh, I, I think the thing about it is this really, I had a 30 year career in social work and um, anyone who has worked in any job for 30 years, but perhaps particularly in the public sector, you will have a lot of anecdotes, <laughs> but 99.9% .9 of those at least are not capable of being developed into a plot. I've got lots of things I could talk about, but, you know, finding the ones that had legs as a plot is a different yeah. match altogether. Yeah. So, um, but again, I mean, this is the, mo the biggest example of being a pantser, okay? And I'm not like this in any other part of my life, but strangely, I'm in this. I was about to start this course at the University of South Wales. It got to the month before. The way the course is structured is that you contribute your writing and you, your cohort on the course, um, read it in advance, and you all get together and you workshop it. And that's how the course works. And it got to the month before, and I hadn't produced anything for the very first workshop and I hadn't thought of anything either. And I sat down and I thought, what am I going to write about? And this is the story that was there. Um, and I should say, and people vary about this, and this is in no way critical of what anybody else might do, but this is just me. Um, the situation that I put Kit Goddard into is one I have seen many times, but this is these are not disguised cases. These are not actual cases that I've dealt with and I've just changed the person's hair colour or I've made their son or daughter or anything like that. For me, that wouldn't be acceptable as a social worker. I have to be able to look people in the eye and know that I'm not putting their lives into my book. They are completely fictional. What I'm doing is I'm taking processes and procedures and ways of handling things and problems that crop up and I'm putting them into a fictional setting. So that's how it works for me. And um, that does mean after 30 years that I do have quite a lot of material that I can draw on. And some of doing this for me was suddenly realizing that we don't see a lot of social workers in fiction. We rarely see them on the television. When we do, the portrayal of them is always really completely wrong. Never is anything like the actual dog or, or the way that, that social work is really. Um, and I realised the potential of it, because actually, as a social worker, you go into people in the most intimate way and you go into the most dramatic situations. And nobody was really writing that. And I saw that as an opportunity, really. And so that's what I did. Um, and the hope is that Kit Goddard will become a series. And so far, the first book has, you know, I'm gratified to say, been received very well. And one of the nicest things about it has been people saying, I want to see more of her. People have yep. taken to her as a character and they want to see her being put into other situations. So, you know, hopefully that's what will continue to happen. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, don't take this the wrong way, but before I, I look, looked at your book and it said it's about a social worker, one doesn't necessarily think, my God, this is going to be a really thrilling book. And it was yeah. fantastically thrilling. And the characters I thought were terribly convincing. I have a particular soft spot for Vernon Griffiths. So I hope he can recover from his heart attack. Oh, I don't want to do any spoilers there, sorry. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I loved him. And he's, he, I, bet, I bet you there's a real Vernon Griffiths somewhere. <laughs> well, but not really. I mean, I, I would love to say, I, I, sh I should tell for people who don't know that um, Vernon is Kip's boss and he is um, 
well, he, he's quite a personality, really, isn't he? He's a sort of, I suppose you'd say, he's a no-nonsense personality. Would that be how you describe him, Mark? With, with, what what with, about with, him would you With a good appetite. He's got a good appetite, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. which will, <laughs> may be the death of him. We'll see. Um, yes, and, and, and there is comedy that comes from that. Um, yes, very which good. is perhaps yes, the excellent. other thing that you don't necessarily associate with social work. But um, I mean, in actual fact, again, anybody who works in the public sector will know that in order to survive it, you have to have a considerable sense of humour. You have to have yeah. some kind of release. So that was important to me as well, that the book should be funny. And I hope it's appropriately funny, even though obviously um, the other side of it is very serious. Yeah. Uh, this is probably not a question so much for you, but for Sam and Vaseem. Has, have you ever uh, written a book and plotted everything out and written it and then jumped it and re restarted? Vaseem, have you? Well, I mean, I <laughs> I wrote seven books that never got anywhere. I mean, do they, do they count? Um, look, I think uh, as time goes by, um, there's, there's a wonderful quote from Terry Pratchett, who was a, I was a huge fan of the Discworld when I was young. That was one of the earliest crap novels that I wrote. That didn't go anywhere, comic sci-fi fantasy. He said that inspiration is, is sleeting through the universe, waiting for someone's brain to pop into. It's kind that's, of like... Yeah, you know, you that's like characters, um, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Um, so I'm one of those people who are constantly hit with these, what I start off by thinking are brilliant ideas, and then I'll, you know, start thinking about it. And, you know, I could write 10 different novels, but the as you go through your career and you work with editors and, you know, you, you have a modicum of... Uh, of, of success and, and your books are, are read quite widely and people start to get back to you about what they liked about your previous books, you begin to temper yourself and, and then you start to select the ideas that you're working with. So one of the things that I've noticed is um, as I've gone through, my, my plots are more complex now as I'm seven books in compared to the first book in my first series, which was The Unexpected Inheritance of, of Inspector Chopra, uh, where we start with a simple setup. Chopra retires, inherits baby elephant, dead boy in the local slum. Um, he has to solve the, the, the mystery. Now, what I tend to do is, um, so you take the second book in the Malabar House series, The Dying Day, which, as you mentioned, is coming out in a couple of months time. You have two plots, you have inter and they intertwine at some point. And what we're, what, what I'm doing is trying to bring history, uh, but also the setting of India in the 1950s, and take people. A lot of my audiences in, are in the west, in Western countries, and take them to this India, uh, and the the assault on the senses that you get when you travel to a place like that. And I and that was the same for me. I'd never been there until I was age 23. And I went there and I spent 10 wonderful years there but to try and bring that to life on the page. That's your first objective. And then to seed that with a, a, a plot. So in The Dying Day, this is a plot that's been 20 years in the making. Uh, when I was living in India, I went to an institution called the Asiatic Society of Bombay, which was set up by the British. And what I discovered, and it's quite shocking to me because I had no idea that these kind of things were stored in places like the Asiatic Society, is that there is a 600 year old copy of Dante's The Divine Comedy, one of the two oldest in the world, apparently, uh, stored at the Asiatic Society. Uh, and so, you know, in, in this book, uh, The Dying Day, it goes missing. Persis is called in to try and find this national treasure. I mean, it was a, it was a manuscript that Mussolini once offered a million dollars to buy, but the Indian government turned him down. And then murders begin to happen, and it becomes clear that there are dark forces pursuing this thing and there's a series of, of riddles uh, very in the vein of the Da Vinci Code. So they're coded riddles which uh, she has to solve and, and you know try and track down this manuscript while these murders are happening around her. Uh, so for me, that's the complexity of a plot is something that comes as you gain more, more experience and confidence in, your, in yourself and your own writing, I think. Yeah, sounds great. Looking forward to Doesn't it. Sound I brilliant. <laughs> yeah, sounds I think you mentioned the... Uh, but Dante is mentioned in passing, I think, in, in the other book, the, the Midnight book. But um, anyway, can't, can't wait to read it. Thank Sam, you. how about you? Are you, are you uh, have you junk plots or are you, or are you getting more complex as you go along? Um, I like a good complex story um, and I always have done. So I like different. I like to have at least two stories weaving through. Um, and yeah, like Basim, Little Bones, which is my first book, the first Cat Connolly book, um, it's a story about a cat who's a, a guarded detective who finds the bones of um, a baby's bones hidden in the hem of a wedding dress. 
Um, and that's that's quite a complex story and different things are happening. Um, but I that was my fifth book. So I have, yeah, four in the four or five in the drawer, um, bits of books and whole books and all sorts um, before I got to that stage. I think it's it's about learning the craft, isn't it? It's about uh, finding your way into the story and finding your voice and all of those things. Um, and I love that Vassim's tried sci-fi comedy because sometimes, I mean, I've always written crime pretty much, but sometimes it takes a while for you to find your genre, doesn't it? Especially if you read widely. So, um, yeah, I like complex plots. They've, they've, and I think because I'm a plotter, they tend to start off with there's always a few different storylines but because I'm able to handle those at the start I know what I'm going into um there was one book that I started plotting out but I didn't really have enough story for it to be a full book because I have this this weird chart thing I create which is like 30 columns um across a page and I always think in my head I'm going to write about 3,000 words a chapter and that's going to give me 90,000 words so that's a book I never write 3,000 words a chapter it's usually like 900 to 1,200 and Instead of 30 chapters, there's, you know, 60. But uh, it just has that framework. Um, and I started plotting it out, and I think I got to about chapter 22, and it sort of fizzled out. Um, but it it was better than writing the 80,000 words to find that it fizzled out. Um, <laughs> so I was able to then say, well, no, I'm just going to, this is not going to work. I'm going to park this and, uh, and move on to something else. So, yeah, I have. Okay. And I've written a spare book. The book I was, when I was writing, um, when I got the idea for The Dark Room, and I felt it would be a better follow-up to keep your eyes on me. Um, there's a book in the middle called High Pressure that I wrote and I don't know what to do with that. So we'll wait and see what happens. But yeah, it was a fair, <laughs> fair book. <laughs> so some some writers um, don't like to read other books when they're reading or specifically, I mean, I don't like to read books about World War Two, fiction about World War Two, or watch Inspector Foyle or things like that, because that sort of dirties my mind for what I'm trying to deal with. Um, uh, Robin, uh, do you do you uh, do you avoid books when you're writing, or you just carry on reading whatever you like? I carry on reading, but I avoid um, crime novels or police procedurals, non-police procedurals. You know, all of that. I have to only because it it makes me think about my own book, and you have to be able to get away. I think so. That's the time when I would have to read lots of different things, and perhaps yeah. watch a bit more television as well. But yeah. Because you have to be, you have to have that break, don't you? And it, it can be very hard to get your mind away from what you're writing sometimes. And there's a yeah. huge benefit in, in getting away and coming back and looking at it fresh. And then you have a different perspective on what you've written and you can see what needs to, to go. Yeah. So me getting that distance involves that, yeah, very much. Okay. How about you, Sam? Me? Oh, I've, um, I read, yeah, I try and read a lot. I try and read as nearly as much as I like to, I think, because I work quite a lot and obviously I've got quite a busy job during the day, although it's all interconnected. Um, by the time I get to bed at midnight, it's like there's only so much time I've got left reading before I fall asleep. So I'm a slow reader, which really annoys me. Um, but I've just finished reading um, Olivia Keenan's The Murder Box, which was stunning. Um, wonderful twist at the end. Um, at Catherine Ryan Howard's 56 Days is another is a lockdown mystery with an, an amazing premise. And I love reading other people's clever premises. I'm really looking forward to uh, Vasim's Riddles and his Dante. Like, that's right <laughs> up my street. So I'm going to pre-order that minute we finish. And um, so, I, yeah, I love reading. I love reading clever things. I like to read things by, by, you know, people who I would admire and whose writing I would aspire to. So... Um, Callie Taylor's I've just finished her book too actually that's just out now um, and uh, her last holiday I think it's called and that was brilliant as well and I love to see how people put um, different points of view use narrative um, you know whether they're using lots of characters whether it's small scale you know what 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 the structures are because uh, I think we all learn that way um, but I have just finished reading also The Flat Share by Beth O'Leary I was very late to the party on that and it is sensational. I mean, in terms of structure and character and absolutely everything. I, have, I run a writer's group. Um, as about, there's going to be about 100 of them soon. We're just bringing in some new people. And uh, we're all reading the flat. I've got them all reading the flat share so we can go and have a chat about it. Um, because it, um, I just think it's sensational. It's a brilliant book. So that, again, will feed. It feeds the machine. I think you have to keep going um, yeah. and keep feeding that machine with different stuff and um, I love the sound of Asim's books as well and actually um, Shane Dumphy in Ireland is a social worker who writes he wrote a whole load of non-fiction books and then moved into fiction but he has that same yeah same similar type of background yeah. how about you Vasim? Uh, well, firstly, Sam, yeah, said, uh, uh, do you avoid you. books? Do you read? Do you read just normally? Oh, I writing? read. I, I read a huge number of books. But uh, thank you, Sam, for saying such nice things. Um, I, I, I've always read across genres because I started life trying to write, as I said, comic, sci-fi, fantasy, mm -hmm. then literary fiction, contemporary fiction, 
there's even a dodgy erotic romance in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> but uh, I read a lot of crime fiction because I get sent a lot of books. I run a, a quite popular pro podcast called the Red Hot Chili Writers podcast yeah. with someone you've had on this week, my colleague and friend, yeah. uh, Abhi Mukherjee. And, you know, we interview a lot of, of, of well-known and, and inspiring uh, crime right debut crime writers and uh, so we get sent a lot of books to read anyway uh, but uh, you, you mentioned the flat share i read a lot of contemporary uplit um, which is you know it makes you feel good uh, there's always uh, something that goes down but it also it, it arcs up towards the end of those books i love that particular genre i read a lot. what i think is that if you're if you're not reading a lot you're going to struggle uh, at some point, especially if you're an aspiring writer, you're going to struggle uh, to understand what's the, the, the level of, of what's out there to get published. And one of the best exercises I did, uh, and this was years and years ago, is I, down, I downloaded lists of the 100 greatest novels of all time, the Times list, the Guardian list, Pulitzer Prize winners. And I set myself the task of reading 100 picked novels from this. It took me about five years. But we're talking starting from Ulysses to Midnight's wow. Tony to all of these books. Yeah. And, you know, I did it with a pen in hand. So I was underlining some of the great uh, lines that people like Hemingway, etc. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the difference in the kind and the level of prose that I was writing from the beginning of that five year period to the end. It was completely different. And I think that's the first step that for any aspiring writer is to get to the level where your prose is going to stand up. Now, I know it's crime fiction, but that doesn't mean that you can get away with really terrible prose because agents, they will read the first two or three pages. And you know this, Sam and Robin, they will read the first two or three pages. They'll be tired at the end of a week where they haven't discovered anything in the slush pile. And they will literally throw it in the bin if, it, if, the, if the level of prose quality irritates them. So I think reading is absolutely essential to keep your pulse, but also to inspire you. Um, you know, I will read brilliant books in historical fiction uh, while I'm trying to write my next historical fiction, Hilary Mantel, it doesn't even have to be crime fiction. She's done a brilliant series of lectures which are available online called the Wreath Lectures, where she outlines exactly what goes into really great historical fiction. And, you know, just reading her books and listening to those lectures is enough to inspire someone like uh, me, who's much more humble in their ambition, to try and write a really good historical book. Great, great. I'm keeping an eye on the watch and it says that we've got two minutes to go to questions. So one quick, quick question, um, Robin, um, who's your favorite author? It doesn't have to be just crime, anything. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to go for crime, though, and I'm going to go for Sarah Perexky. Um, okay. The I Warshawski novels, which are sure. really interested me in the genre, really. Yeah. Kathleen Turner played it, I think. Yes, that's uh, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sam. Um, I don't have a favourite at the moment. Well, I mean, I love Daphne du Maurier, Rebecca. That's my favourite book of all time. And um, I could read that over and over and over again, like Vasim reading, the, just learning how things go together. Um, so I think, and I think we always as writers want to make our books better. So we want each book to be an improvement. So yeah, I'm, I'm aspiring towards writing Rebecca at some point. I hope you never know. Um, but uh, yeah, so well, there were bits, the bits of it in your book that sort of reminded me. Yeah, yeah. drawing. Well, I was sitting a yeah. hundred yards from Frenchman's Creek when the idea came to me. So okay. I'm literally, there was, there's a massive connection <laughs> there. Yeah. Great. How about you, Vasim? Uh, well, if it's crime fiction, it's Michael Connolly who writes the Harry Bosch oh, book. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree with that. Fiction, yeah. If it's literary fiction, it's, it's Salman Rushdie because I love his, his literary work. But I think the, the author that I admire most, and I still miss him, not that I ever met him, but I still miss him that he's gone, is Terry Pratchett. Because mm -hmm. without Terry Pratchett, I would not be an author. I, I was reading The Discworld in my teens and the, the first crap novel that I wrote that I mentioned and that I actually completed and sent to agents so I could receive my rejection letters. Uh, was that comic sci-fi fancy because I read the Discworld and I thought I can do this better <laughs> I could do it better than Terry Pratchett so that's, that's what you I have said to hold that thought though yeah that ambition is so important you need that to drive you through yeah absolutely well, be before we go for, for what it's worth my two favorite crime writers are Simonon and Patricia Highsmith oh yeah so, Highly recommended now I see at the time the clock has ticked and it's time to welcome Amy to ask her questions Hi, Amy. Good afternoon, everybody. So we've had lots of questions and I've been fielding them as the talk has been going. So I'll start with the first one from Phil, who says, Vaseem, you mentioned that you spent 20 years writing seven books, 
that were never published. How did you find the impetus to keep going? He'd also like to know what the rest of the panel think as well. Okay, so I think it is, um, if you like me have wanted to write from a very young age, it's an ambition. So I only had two ambitions. One was to play cricket internationally for England. Uh, and because I was even worse at that um, <laughs> than I was at writing at the age of 17, that, that ambition, I still play cricket every week and I've just come from a cricket match, which I had to abandon halfway to come and do oh. this. Um, uh, but, uh, but sorry. <laughs> I think the only way that you can carry on is this. You, you have to have a desire within you to be a writer. A very famous literary author called John Irving uh, he wrote The World According to Garp and other books like that. He, when he was a young writer and he was losing his way and he was getting demoralized because he couldn't get anywhere, he met one of his writing heroes and that person reoriented him and said to him, John, you've got to stop saying that one day you will be a writer. You are a writer because you're every day you're creating something and you're writing these books. Now, you may not be successful yet, you may not be published yet, but you are a writer. And if you think like that every morning when you wake up, you will continue to work, you will continue to edit, you will continue to read and inspire yourself. Fantastic. Yeah. Sam? Yeah, that's brilliant, brilliant advice, it really is. I, I think it is, is, you've got to just keep writing. Somebody told me, well, I was about four or five, a friend of mine, Sarah Webb, has now written about 30 books, just keep writing. And that's the only way you get better. You have to keep your eyes on the prize. I mean, it took, yeah, it took me 15 years to be an overnight success too. So it's like, you know, it's it just you just have to keep going and you get better and better. Every word you put on the page makes you a better writer. So you keep Absolutely. going. Fantastic. What about you, Robin? Um, well, uh, Allegation was the first novel that I'd written, um, mm. really, all the way through. I, I had half a novel that I'd written before, but I that wasn't wasted. That became the subplot of Allegation, actually. So... That bit for me wasn't so difficult, but what was difficult for me was the sending out to agents uh, stage and the, the number of agents that I sent to before I found my fantastic agent, Patricia Rutherford. And so during that, there was a process of trying to keep the faith a bit. And the only thing I can really say is that I kept going because I didn't know what was going to happen, but I felt like I had finally found what I should be doing and I finally found my passion. And there wasn't any way, having found it, that I could give up on it, really. Brilliant. The next question we have comes from Fiona, and she would like to know, what do Sam and Vaseem think an animal brings to the dynamic of a story? Should we start with you, Sam? Oh, yeah, because you've got elephants. I'm just, yeah, I'm thinking. I, I, I didn't know what, the dog that came into my book came, as I say, with the idea with the girl, and, um, it, and I'd never written an animal in there before, but everybody loves the dog. So how, how do people relate to your elephant, Vaseem? Well, I mean, the, the elephant, I get a lot of mail from around the world. And the elephant is the number one query that people have, you know, how is he doing? How, make sure you don't, nothing bad happens to this elephant. So just to set it in context, I arrived in India um, and I'd never seen an elephant except in a zoo. But within five minutes of leaving Bombay Airport, <laughs> there was this massive great elephant in the middle of this chaotic traffic scene in Bombay. And that stuck with me. So when I got back to the UK and I wanted to put those great memories of India into a book, I, I, I was at that stage where I didn't think I was going to get published after 20 odd years of rejection. Mm. So I decided to write that book, uh, The Unexpected Inheritance of Inspector Chopra, purely for myself. I put in all the things I like, I, crime fiction, a murder, you know, a detective who's serious and rigid and, and honest in a sea of corruption. And then I gave him this baby elephant to look after so that we could uncover, unpick more aspects of his very rigid rigid character and the elephant is a it's a symbol it's a metaphor for India it's not you know I don't it doesn't fly or sing or, or solve the mysteries or anything like that but it does allow me to put this little vein of humor throughout the rather darker descriptions of, of India that I'm uh, showcasing in that series the baby Ganesh series uh, because India is this this interplay of light and, and dark where we've got this modern India which is rich money's flown in and, and cultures are changing to a more westernized especially in the cities but you also got uh, legacy India which is caste pre prejudice and you know poverty and we're seeing now with the pandemic how badly it's hitting especially the poorer regions mm. of India the imbalance that in society and Chopra cares about that deeply and so having that elephant allows me to lighten that uh, when we're talking about the darker aspects. Mm. That's really interesting sorry I can't just say really interesting that it's the book that you needed to write for yourself that was the one that was the breakout it's yeah. when you start writing the only books that you can write because it's the book that's yeah. in you 
that makes the difference and then that becomes and the same for me yeah so it's you have to work right until stop trying to be everybody else and try and be yourself yeah. so you I, I, I can't, I'm, you, you've just made me think of a quote and I can't remember who said it, but it's better to write for yourself and have no public yeah. than to write for the public and have no self. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. So true. Good one. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of, I mean, Vasim, you briefly mentioned earlier that you were either going to be a writer or a cricket player. Um, and one of the questions that we have from uh, Louise is, if you weren't authors, what would you do? <laughs> I'm playing cricket for England. You know, I'd be a bad cricket player, I think. Um, look, I mean, I've been lucky in my life. I, I worked in India for a decade and I never thought a single day was work because it was such an incredible environment to be in. India was making that great change. Since the, for the last 15 years, I've worked at uh, a university in central London, UCL, in a crime and security department surrounded by amazing colleagues. And it's great as a crime author to be able to tap into all of that, all of that knowledge. Um, you know, I wouldn't change anything uh, about my life, to be honest, uh, because those experiences, some of those experiences that I've had in my life, they are what go into these novels. This is why I'm so passionate about uh, crime writing in general. But, but you know, obviously my own books are, are very special to me. The biggest aspect for me of finally being published after 23 years is that by then you're maturer. So the early dreams as a 17 year old of instant fame and success and fortune and bestseller and all of that and awards, I've ticked all of those boxes. But what means more to me now is the interaction with readers and how they respond to books. And I try and answer all of the letters that I get, the emails, etc. It's hard, it's difficult to find the time to do all of that. But I try that and I love the interaction. And it's a, the last year has been difficult because I go to a lot of events and it's so nice to be able to mingle with readers afterwards. You know, Sam, you know this, mm. um, how, how, uh, how pleasing it is just to have a conversation with readers uh, who, who may or who may criticize your book as well. Not just necessarily always like it, but, you know, just to have that interaction. What about you, Robin? Um, well, of course, I was a social worker for 30 years, and that was no accident. <laughs> it was, um, you know, although uh, writing is hugely important to me, social work was very challenging and very fulfilling as well. So um, that would still be my choice if I had my time over. And in the same similar way um, to, as Basim just said, that then fed into my fiction at the end of the day. So there wasn't any wrong turn there. I took a particular path and yet still found my way right back to writing, but I certainly don't regret the way that I went to get there. Fantastic. Sam? Oh. Um, well, as well as writing, I always wanted to set up my own business. And so when I started writing and realised I really needed to learn how to do it properly, um, and there weren't any courses that worked for me, my husband's in the police force, so um, he worked shifts and I had kids and that meant babysitters and a whole lot. So I decided I'd set up my own courses. I was working in event management at the time and I'd come from a marketing background. So that grew, actually. I set up something called Inkwell um, and then that just became what I do now. So I, it grew into a publishing consultancy, which became enormously successful. Which I, It turned out a whole load of other people were in exactly the same boat as I was and couldn't do courses and liked what I was doing. Um, and then I set up a website called writing.ie and um, now I'm on the board of the Society of Authors, on the board with the, the Crime Writers Association with Basim, just, just in the door. And um, that's what I love doing. I love just working with writers. I love working with new writers and helping them show them what I didn't know. You know, if somebody had been there for me, it would, and the same with Vassim, it, like it wouldn't have taken you 23 years if you'd, take, yeah. if you'd had the help, you know, it wouldn't have taken me so long if I had that help that say writing.ie can give you now. Um, and, it, and getting out there for free is really important to me, that everybody can access it, um, that the resources are there and it doesn't matter. You know, I don't have the time and the resources necessarily to do an MFA or a Faber course or any of those types of things. Um, and that again is why it takes you time to do these things. But if you can, if I can make those things available, that's that's what I love doing. So, so I do them both, write, writing and that. Yeah, brilliant. Um, the next question that we have is is sneakily from me, <laughs> <laughs> and it's something that I'm always really interested to hear from authors. Um, and it's it's kind of based around desert island discs, but it's desert island books. So if you were stuck on a desert island and you could only take three books with you what they be and why. Oh, goodness. We start with you, the same. Silence of the Lambs. So simply because it is a textbook in how to write crime fiction. 
everything from the characters' names to the to the fact that the prose is fantastic to the plot. It's just, just a perfect crime novel, so that'll definitely go with me. Um, Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie, because not only because it won the Booker Prize, uh, but also because it is the be uh, the best description of India passing through independence and the other uh, the other side uh, that I have run. And also because he writes in a magical realist style, uh, which is a style that uh, is quite difficult, but it's uh, it's one that appeals to me. So, and the last one would be uh, Watership Down, which was the biggest book that I read when I was a child that really made me think. I want to do this, you know, even as I think it was, I was eight or nine or 10. And I thought, you know, this is a book about rabbits, but you know, they, there's murder, there, there's killing, there's, there's all sorts of torture and torment that goes on in this book. This is the kind of book that I, I want, I think I can write even as a 10 year old. Yeah, I remember reading that as a child and my parents just thinking that it was a, a sweet little book about rabbits and <laughs> you know, unknowingly giving me this book and, and I, I think I was actually a little bit traumatised. I was probably a little bit too young, but what a fantastic book. What about you, Sam? What would you take with you? Um, I'd have to take Rebecca uh, because I just adore it. Um, it's a romance. It's a mystery. It's a crime novel. It's a literary fiction novel. Every time you read it, you see something different. It's fantastic. Um, I would think I would probably take like Bessie and Watership Down. I would take Elizabeth, Elizabeth Googe's Little White Horse because that's a book I read as a child, which made... I can still picture scenes from that book now and I haven't read it for I don't know how many years. Um, I adore it. Um, and then uh, for the third one, actually, it probably would be a Terry Pratchett. I don't know. I, I love the Tiffany series, the Tiffany Aiken um, books. Of the I think there's four of them on there. And, the, and I read them out loud to my children and I must have read them all about the whole series twice because there's two children at least four times. Um, and I could read them forever. So we'd, you'd have to pack the three into a seat. I'm sure there's a compendium, is there, of the Tiffany Aiken books, because I love those. Fantastic. And Robin? Oh, I've been tempted by Rebecca and Silence of the Lambs, but I'm going to go unusually for Peyton Place by Grace Natalius, um, because it's the book in which I read um, at probably quite an inappropriately young age, actually, which first interested me in the idea of looking at the underbelly of small town life, which is what I think Allegation ultimately is about. I'm going to go back before any of the Jackson Brody um, by Kate Atkinson, any of those, and I'm going to go for anything by Christopher Moretis, who is a, a Welsh writer who I think is uh, an incredible writer. He wrote Shifts, which is the classic Welsh post-industrial novel um, and somewhat under-recognised um, and an incredible writer. So those would be my three. Brilliant. Okay, so we have another question uh, and this one again is from Louise and she says that when she's reading or doing her crea creative writing, she cannot have any noise. Do you write in silence or do you listen to music? Basim? Silence. I mean, I can't stand even the slightest noise if, I, if I'm writing. Uh, the, the best part of writing for me is that moment, it might be early in the morning, middle of the night, when you're, you're so immersed in your idea and your, your fingers are flying over the keyboard that the rest of the world has just faded away and you are literally in your book. You are living your book, you are living through your characters. Uh, and I don't think you can achieve that if you've got heavy metal rock and roll going on. And I have a friend who writes that way, that's, which is why I say that. Brilliant. Sam? I'm a mixture. So I would have had, when I was writing the Cat Conley books, I had a soundtrack, which was a Cat Conley, um, which was like the pop music. because She's about 24, I think, in the books, um, a lot younger than me. And um, because I have a very busy life and I tend to write on the move a lot, I literally have to mind time. So I, I used to travel a lot. It was great. Um, so I'd write in planes and trains and cafes and wherever. And I'd plug in my my earphones. And once I got her soundtrack going, it like blocks out the rest of the noise. It blocks out all the invoices that need doing and the other bits and pieces that you need to be doing when you're running a business. So I found that really useful. But it varies. So I can I can write in silence, too. I write. Yeah, I'm good with noise. And Robin? I, I like to have music. <clears throat> but it does have to be my music. I can't, I can't bear to be able to hear any noise from anyone else, television or music from another room. I can't stand it. 
but I do like to have music. So, um, and I go, to give my age away, I go back to the soundtrack of my youth, really. So lots of Elvis Costello, Genesis, anything like that. Fantastic. And I've just noticed a comment um, from Anne on the stream who would like to, you to repeat the name of the Welsh writer that you mentioned. Christopher Meredith. Fantastic. Okay, next question. Um, this one's from Alice. Uh, and you talked a little bit about themes being important to publishers, but is it important to you too? Should we start with you, Faseem? Yes, every every book that I write. Um, I mean, why, one of the one of the reasons that writers, once they get a bit into their careers, want, uh, write books is because something's irritating them. Something that, about the world that they live in that they want to comment on and books are a vehicle they're a voice for us to be able to do that you can't really do that when you're just struggling to get published possibly because you you know you're 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 flapping in the wind you're just trying to get a book out there and see if anybody if there are any takers but once you're reasonably established you do want to to look at those themes and for me the biggest themes that i uh, want to explore are one how do i recreate this Indian society that I saw living there on the streets of a place like Bombay from a relatively privileged position. I still remember the first time that I went to, to the biggest slum in Asia. It's called the Dharavi slum and it appears in uh, The Unexpected Inheritance of Inspector Chopra. To see people living eight to a room, very few medical facilities in the slum, you know, very few, uh, very little hygiene, and yet they would just get on with life. Um, it's just another aspect of day-to-day -day existence for them. So for me to be able to showcase that as a backdrop to hopefully intriguing uh, crime stories is, is the kind of overarching theme that I am trying to explore with all of these books, whether they're set in modern India or whether they're set in uh, 1950s India. And Sam? Um, yeah, themes certainly for me in the dark room are important. I think you, the more time you have to plan a book, or certainly for me, then the more you can get into that level um, of thinking of things. So, yeah, so I was, so secrets and time are themes in, in the dark room. And um, there are others as well that I can't think of off the top of my head. But, yeah, no, I absolutely went through and was thinking about the symbolism and how I was going to reflect that in those themes and how I was going to develop them. Um, it starts off with a homeless man um, who um, the story is a story about um, a documentary director who is investigating why homeless people end up on the street. Um, and that's how we come into the dark room. And that's the story. He he dies. And it's his story that Rachel is trying to explore when she goes to Hare's Landing. He's an Irish background as well. And um, so there are lots of themes there I wanted to investigate. Yeah, And things that things that I suppose that have struck me that um, I was interested in. I was interested in the isolation of a country house and um, that sense of claustrophobia. There's a lot of rain and there's very poor Internet in Hare's Landing. Um, and I wanted to get that sense across of, you know, something something happening and people being trapped somewhere. So there's a little bit of that too. Brilliant. And finally, Robin. Yeah, so well, I think because I, I'm only on my second novel, <laughs> because the follow up to allegation will be out next year. Um, this is something that I'm still developing, really. Um, so yes. Um, and I suppose one of the themes that interests me that I see developing across the Pit Goddard series is the showcasing of the different aspects of Wales. Um, so in terms of, the, you know, Wales is very multifaceted, very variable country. You've got the seaside towns, you've got the rural areas, you've got the valleys communities, you've got the, the big cities. So one of the things I want to do with, um, with the series is to explore all of those and to explore lots of aspects of life in Wales, really. Fantastic. Now, we do have more questions, but unfortunately, I think we're I'm a little bit of time. Um, so thank you everybody for, for asking such great questions and, and thank you to, to you guys for answering them. I'm going to hand you back over to Mark now, who's going to end the panel. Thanks, Amy. Um, and thank you, everyone. Um, at this point, I think I just do a reminder about Penarast Bookshop in Machanleth. I will not ask the, the panel members to repeat what I just said. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, that's where you'll find the books and it's all on the website. So thank you to the audience, fantastic. Thank you all for asking your questions, for bearing with us, listening with interest to a, a fascinating panel. I really enjoyed it. Thanks to Basim, Sam and Robin. Thank you, Amy. And thanks to Sam Ebenezer, who's producing our events. And I hope very much to see you all next year in person in Aberystwyth.
Oh, Goodbye. yeah, we'll be there for sure. <laughs> Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank, bye.